A Glasgow Rangers match against Glasgow Celtic. As in every game they play against each other, it's not just about football rivalry. It's about deep-seated sectarianism. That's what we've got out to say is, the Protestants beating the Catholics, that's all it is. The end of the 1980s Scottish Cup final at Hampden Park, Glasgow, between the city's two biggest football sides, Rangers and Celtic. Hundreds of fans fought a pitch battle on the field. Violence at football matches has become a cause for concern throughout Britain. In Glasgow, it's become predictable. At every match between Rangers and Celtic, scores of fans are arrested. While alcohol and social deprivation must take their share of the blame, one thing makes the violence in Glasgow unique, religion. Rangers, whose club colours are royal blue, have supporters who are overwhelmingly Protestant. Celtic fans, sporting green and white, are predominantly Catholic. <laughs> like Celtic are uh, basically a, a Catholic team with a Catholic support and Rangers are a Protestant team. Well, for a start, I was always brought up as a Protestant, like, and just always brought up from that, I always supported Rangers. And to support Rangers, you hate Celtic, because they're Catholics and, well... Oh, my mate's not that at all, Protestants, no. It's not bother me, no. I don't care, but I, when you go to the match, it's different then. It's a fever, man. You, you hate them all then. I, I don't actually hate them personally, because I, I, I don't know that many Catholics, like, but it's just what they're doing in Ireland. They started that, like, and, well, they're just animals, in my opinion. Religion and football are formative influences on almost anyone growing up in Glasgow. Protestant and Catholic children play football together, but from the age of five, they go to separate schools. Segregated education has played a role in keeping the communities apart, but the religious division turns violent only when Rangers meet Celtic. Many churchmen in Scotland of both denominations are concerned about the link between religion and soccer violence. Joseph Devay is one of Glasgow's Roman Catholic bishops. When you view all the factors which contribute to violence in this game and set it against other club matches, then the single incident which stands out, of course, is the religious element. Therefore, at the end, one must conclude that it's religion or false religion which is the source of a very great deal of the trouble in this particular match. The clashes at the 1980 Cup final were immediately condemned by the churches. The Protestant Church of Scotland, in its General Assembly, put the blame for the trouble firmly on the clubs, and especially the Protestant team, Rangers. The General Assembly condemns sectarian violence in Scotland, typified by the scenes following this year's Scottish Cup at Hampden. While recognising that football violence is by no means restricted to Scotland, and has many causes, we feel that tensions would be eased if all clubs, and Rangers Football Club in particular, would publicly disclaim sectarian bias in... The motion put by a Perthshire minister, John Ostler, was passed by a two-to-one majority, with about 200 delegates abstaining. Donald MacDonald is a Glasgow minister who lives and works less than a mile from the Rangers Stadium, Ibrox Park. He's one churchman who gave the position taken nationally by the church a cautious welcome. I think I'd have to make one or two comments on it. One is the extraordinary length of time that it's actually taken the Church of Scotland to pass this motion. Uh, it's not a situation that has suddenly arisen within the past 12 months. We've lived with this for a long time. Um, the second one is that there was a substantial number of people, um, something like about 200 people, who actually voted against the motion. 
uh, which worries me a great deal. I think it can certainly be pointed out that there are a lot of elders and church workers in central Scotland who consistently react badly if the church officially criticizes this sort of stance. I think it's also important perhaps to say that there's a large number of ministers in central Scotland who get what some would regard as the very great privilege of getting free season tickets uh, to Ibrox, a uh, prime stand seats, and a lot of them will take them up on any given Saturday in the year. And I can certainly vouch for this because I myself have been offered uh, such a ticket at various stages during uh, my um, own experience as a minister in Glasgow. This morning's problem, which is the layout. Donald MacDonald has had first hand experience of the loyalty of some Church of Scotland members to Rangers Football Club. The Bush newspaper, which he helped to publish on behalf of the church's Glasgow Presbytery, ran a hard hitting editorial critical of the club, and many churchgoers were outraged. Subscriptions to the paper were cancelled, and ministers banned it from their congregations. The paper lost thousands of copies and is now in serious financial trouble. The singing in the gallery was particularly good today, particularly good. One minister who thinks that the Bush was wrong to criticise Rangers is Reverend James Curry. And he was angered too by the motion passed at the General Assembly. But I really deplore it, and I think that the young minister uh, was ill-advised to make that particular motion in the floor of the General Assembly. Football violence is a phenomenon of our time, and I don't think Rangers are in any way more to blame than any other team. It's drink, which is at the root of most of the trouble. When you saw these young English supporters in Italy carrying on the way they did, goodness gracious, it was drink that was doing it. And I'm quite sure that it, the alcohol is responsible far, far more than sectarianism. But both Rangers and Celtic do draw their support from opposite sides of the sectarian divide, and the roots of this lie deep in the social history of Glasgow. There are 300,000 Catholics out of a total population of just under a million Glaswegians. They're mostly descendants of Irish immigrants drawn in by the heavy industrial expansion of the late 19th century. They've always been a minority, but a substantial one. In the 1880s, many of them were very poor and needed the help of the Catholic Church to survive. Celtic Football Club grew out of the church's charitable work. It would be, I think, almost a century ago now that an Irish Mary's brother formed this club really to meet some of the athletic needs of unemployed young people in the east end of Glasgow. And there was a certain charitable dimension to this work to feed some of the city's neediest poor. Catholics will tend to see Celtic as somehow their thing. It's the other way around, regrettably, for all too many Celtic supporters who somehow imagine that this is some kind of a curious front for the Catholic Church. In fact, the original aims of Celtic Football Club to raise money for poor Catholic children were very quickly abandoned. Within four years of Celtic being formed in 1888, no cash was being donated to charity, and within 10 years, the club was turned into a limited company. At the same time, the club began to select players from outside the Catholic community. But the Catholic connection was preserved, and it continues today. It was a fairly uh, obvious um, sign of uh, an interconnection that many, many parishes would have a Celtic supporters club. It wasn't quite a parochial organisation. It tended to operate um, under the umbrella of the parish rather than being of the parish. But there's no doubt that this did happen. Another link which has been preserved over the years is the Irish connection. It can be seen in the streets around the two grounds and in the badges and scarfs of the fans. Many Rangers fans support Ulster's Protestant extremist groups, while sympathy for Irish republicanism is common among Celtic fans. Right side Parkhead to sell Irish tricolours, right? Which we blemish in the air. Right side Ibrox to sell Ulster flags. Now there's no way they would do that in any other club team in the country. It's just because we are basically Irish. Although the, some Celtic supporters will deny that, we are an Irish team. The Celtic supporters says, uh, I said, Alan mean, said they're being there. The, the staff of the IRA and this thing the IRA cancelled. And it's been, the IRA are an, an illegal set of murdering. 
bastards they've just been. Celtic fans believe in the United Ireland and the Rangers fans still believe in the uh, upholding a, a loyalist state kind of thing. The UDAs are sort of a uh, defence of Ireland. I think the people that are on the offensive are the guilty ones and that happens to be the IRA. Uh, we wear troops out badges as well. Basically the Celtic support our Athenian support. We believe in the United Ireland. We believe the only way there will be peace in Ireland is for the British to get out of Ireland. One more factor preserving the connection between Glasgow and the north of Ireland is the level of support over there for both clubs. Rangers have more than 30 supporters clubs in Northern Ireland. Celtic have 14 clubs in the north and many more in the Republic. Both sets of fans come over regularly to take part in the ritual of a Rangers-Celtic confrontation. All right, Tommy, can you tell me um, where you've come from to see the game today? North Belfast, spent a few days over here, taking the game, see a few friends. How often do you come over to Scotland to watch Rangers and Celtic? Well, 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 come every match. Six or seven times. Six or seven times a year. Well, on an average, about six times a year, at least. While both clubs are alike in relying heavily on support from their respective religious communities, they differ in their policies on team selection. Celtic do not discriminate on the grounds of religion. Their 1980 cup-winning side comprised six Protestants and just five Catholics. But Rangers are an entirely different matter. They have not signed a Catholic in the last 30 years. Sectarianism began to creep into the Rangers boardroom soon after the First World War. Uh, a lot of people came back uh, from the war. Uh, the industries which wartime had kept booming on Clydeside were suddenly in decline. Shipbuilding, the armaments, heavy engineering thing. And a lot of those who returned suddenly found that jobs were being competed for, mostly by Irish immigrants within the area. And um, you did the short formula, my job's been taken, who's it been taken by? An Irish immigrant, who's the Irish immigrant? He's a Roman Catholic. And the whole polarization of that sort of society happened. And it was an attitude that hardened um, over the next four or five years in the city and it had its own spin-off into the sporting thing and rangers i think suddenly discovered that there was some profit and some market to be made in becoming a recognizably protestant club one player who believes he fell victim to the dislike of catholics inside rangers is graham fife pictured here alongside the team manager on a victory procession Fife joined Rangers in 1969 as a promising junior. Within a season, he'd established himself as a regular first team player, and his future seemed assured. Then one day, during a break in training, he was called to see the manager. So I went up, up to his room to see him, and he, he told me that someone had, had called up and said that I was going with a Catholic girl. So I went up uh, to his room, and he asked me this, you know, and at the time, really, it wasn't true because I wasn't going with the girl at the time. But Graham Fife did go out with his girlfriend Mary again, and soon they decided to get married. Although neither was especially religious, Graham was a Protestant and Mary came from a Catholic family. News of their marriage plans broke in the Scottish press. I don't really know how the newspapers got to hear about it, but one day I was, you know, I was sitting in my mother's house in Motherwell, and um, next thing I know, there's, there's newspaper paper people at the door. So at first, you know, I, I tried to, to hunt them, but um, they just wouldn't go away. With a perseverance, eventually, I had to end up telling them, you know, I was, was getting married to a Catholic girl, and they took photographs. Fife was again called to see the manager after the story appeared in the Sunday newspaper. Well, I, I reported to Ibrox the next day, and I was called in to see the manager, and he asked me, you know, was it true or... I told them it was true and that um, we were getting married. I couldn't keep it a secret any longer, you know. And um, he asked me where I was getting married. I told him it was in the church. And he made sure that it was the Protestant church he was talking about. And he, he also said that my wife had to really turn a Protestant, you know. Graham and Mary were married in a Protestant church but his problems were not over. 
he found it increasingly hard to get into the first team, even though he remained a favourite with the sporting press. Eventually, he says, the pressure began to tell and his performance began to suffer. It definitely suffered because, I mean, to, to go with that pressure on you, you've got to play sort of like Pele and there's nobody in the world can, can do that. You know, I mean, it really, it was a bit, a bit of a strain. The pressure on Fife became so great that he asked for a transfer. He left Rangers in 1976, and after three frustrating years playing for other Scottish clubs, he went to America, where last year he was the top scorer for the Pittsburgh Spirits. He's always blamed the Rangers management for disrupting his career in Scottish football. I think that uh, you've got to look inside the club to get the problems, really. You've got to look within the directors, the managers, or whatever, you know. As far as I'm concerned, direct cause was because I married a Catholic girl. To me, that, that is the, the big point, really, you know, that I'd done something wrong. I felt I'd done something wrong, and really, I didn't know really what I had done wrong, you know, just because I got married. Six months after Graham Fife left Ibrox in 1976, Rangers came under intense pressure to change their ways. These scenes occurred in Birmingham, at what was to have been a friendly against Aston Villa. After Rangers fans rioted, the match was abandoned halfway through. This was the latest in a long line of incidents involving the club's travelling support, and there were demands that something should be done. General Manager Willie Waddle the following week announced a package of new measures at a press conference from which cameras were excluded. His measures were designed to cut the incidents of riots. In an effort to reduce sectarian tension, the club pledged that they would sign a Catholic player if one good enough came along. Brian Wilson, who writes on Scottish football for the Sunday Times, was sceptical at the time. I, I don't think for a moment that they had any intention of changing their policy. I think they responded purely to the, the, the circumstances that exist, the, the, the pressure of publicity, the pressure of politicians, of newspapers, of commentators, asking questions, saying, what is going on? This cannot be tolerated. And in order to get the heat off in a very short-term, expedient way, then they made the announcement that the policy uh, was, was, was to be abandoned. But there's no subsequent evidence of it. Rangers certainly seem to have had difficulty in recruiting young Catholic players. The club's scouting system is geared to finding talent in Protestant schools and Protestant church boys clubs. But they've also shown no interest in top Catholic players who have been on the market recently. Frank McGarvey was transferred from St Mirren to Liverpool in 1979 for £300,000 and transferred back to Celtic a year later for a quarter of a million. Arthur Graham left Aberdeen for Leeds United in 1977 for £140,000. Both players are Scottish internationals, both are Catholics, and both have been available since Rangers made their public pledge. We wanted to ask Rangers about their policy towards Catholics, but all our requests were turned down. The club refused permission for our cameras to film inside their stadium and refused to give an interview or even a statement to Credo about the club's current position. There is evidence that Rangers policy has a sound financial basis. There are two reasons why they persist with the policy. One, I think that I must concede to them that they are honest men, that they are genuine 21 carat bigots, and they actually like what they're doing, and they like this little power structure that they find themselves at the top of. But that's only half of the argument, because it's more of a convenient uh, happenstance, but it's also an extremely profitable business. But some people make a very great deal out of sectarianism in terms of financial benefits and really the, the important thing in looking at the, the finances of Rangers Football Club is to realize that the profitability what's going into the shareholders pocket it's not really affected by trivial matters like a success or failure in the park it's the, it murky. It's a Rangers do seem capable of surviving a poor season of results the 79-80 season was one of Rangers worst for a long time they finished halfway down the Scottish Premier League and failed to reach the quarter-finals of the League Cup, as well as losing the final of the Scottish Cup to Celtic. But their average league crowd was still more than 20,000. The league champions, Aberdeen, have an average gate of only 13,000. Many Rangers fans we spoke to said they'd no longer support their team if Rangers signed a Catholic. The team's failure so far to implement their pledge to sign Catholics doesn't seem to have harmed their gates or finances, 
as Donald MacDonald points out. It's astonishing that in a city which has got an extraordinary rate of unemployment, which is in the middle of a recession, its industries are dying, you know, the people are moving out of it. Here is a small private business firm which is going to spend about £7 million on improving its own grounds. What happens is that it's a very profitable business still in Glasgow to be in the business of bigotry, even if you're masquerading as sport. Rangers claim that their big ground improvements are helping to eradicate crowd trouble. Undoubtedly, violence inside the stadium has been brought under control to some extent. But at this recent Rangers-Celtic match, fans still clashed as they left the stadium. I don't argue it in terms of crowd violence at all. In fact, I've got very great sympathy for the kids, the kind of kids who run onto the, 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 the field at the end of the Scottish Cup final. My argument isn't with them at all. We live in a society where there isn't all that much going for them. There are not a great deal of alternative attractions or outlets. This is the natural kind of ethos to get involved in. They are not the ones who make the policies. They are only the ones who are led. They are the fodder for policies which are made by cynical people who should know and do know a lot better. While Rangers appear unwilling or unable to translate their publicly stated policy into practice, it seems that little can be done to make them change their ways. A policy of excluding Catholics doesn't fall within the terms of the Race Relations Act, since the Act doesn't cover discrimination on the grounds of religion. Pressure from the churches might just have helped to influence Rangers. However, Scotland's religious establishment has done very little to combat sectarianism in football, as Glasgow's Roman Catholic Bishop Joseph Devine admits. It is perhaps hoped that the problem would go away in the context of gradual civilising of our community. But what it must do now is seek to lead all the public authorities into working together in the hope that we will resolve the problem, because failure to do so will mean that the, the image of this city as a football city will be continually blighted, and its two leading football clubs will be continually, in their reputation, suffer reverses. The reputation of football in Scotland is the responsibility of the Scottish Football Association. They, as well as Rangers, declined to be interviewed for Credo. But they did tell us that after taking legal advice, they felt they had no authority to make Rangers change their practice. I think if you, you scrape the surface, that the kind of people who find themselves in the, in the SFA, the kind of small businessmen who are directors of provincial Scottish football clubs, then you'd probably find quite a reservoir of sympathy for the, the attitudes of, of Rangers. So I don't look to Scotland, I look outside it. Uh, and I think if you look at the constitutions of the, the ruling bodies of football, of FIFA and UEFA, then you'll find that, that it's incumbent upon national associations as a condition of membership of these bodies to ensure that the game is played without regard to race, colour or creed. And so what I would like to see is one of these bodies investigating the, the state of affairs in Scottish football, and if it finds independently that the Scottish Football Association is not meeting that condition of membership, then they would tell the SFA that they must put their house in order. Even if Rangers were to sign a Catholic player tomorrow, it would not necessarily banish violence from Glasgow football. The bigotry runs too deep for that. But until there's an end to sectarianism in the Rangers boardroom, it's unlikely there will be an end to violence on the football terraces in the streets of Glasgow. What is important is that literally hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions, of young Scots have been headed into the blind alley of sectarian attitudes through, of all things, of football. But sport, instead of being an influence for good and, of, and, of, and of for creativity and for, for all the, the things that sports should be associated with, uniquely in Scotland, we find it as being an instrument of leading kids into this ludicrous nonsense of sectarianism. Well, bye.